you're sprinting up every hill, you might do four hours, 250, 300 TSS, like, they're proper smash fest. And to go out and do that and enjoy it and not get home completely fucked requires carbohydrates. You can't do that just eating whatever you want. What's going on guys? Today we're gonna to be listening to a part of a recent episode from the Real Science of Sport podcast. It's a podcast done by Professor Ross Tucker and a sports journalist called Mike Finch. The episode I'm gonna be referring to is season three, episode 19, which is the science of nutrition in sport. So they got on this nutritionist, sports nutrition, I think he's a researcher or specialist called Graham Close. But obviously I have cherry picked pizza out and the entire episode is quite interesting. So it's probably worth listening to the entire thing. It's such a controversial and difficult one to broach. I've often thought about people who we should invite. And then I think, okay, if I invite this person, there's going to be a whole army of people criticizing his selection. And then I invite another person, there'll be a whole bunch of people saying that we've corrupted ourselves by inviting <laughs> her instead of him and so on. Yeah. So what he's saying there is, He's been nice and hasn't sort of named names, but I'll just I'll just say that is if they get on someone who's who says something bad about carbs or isn't in the isn't in favor of carbohydrates for training, then someone like Julian Ryder will call, will probably call them out, and that sort of camp will get will be against it. And then in the other side of things, the, the, obviously the high fat camp. So I don't know, like someone like Tim Noakes, I don't think he sort of calls people out that often, but you know that sort of camp will get pissed off. So he's he's saying here that. They haven't done a podcast on nutrition in the past because they don't want to they don't want to be on one side of the fence. Podcasting, we've always been a little bit nervous to do anything on sports nutrition, um, mainly because it's kind of this uh, very murky place where finding an expert is often quite difficult, and, and even the most uh, credible experts are often seen as uh, can always be questioned. So, Ross, <laughs> for them, he is the, the the source of truth and shouldn't be too polarizing. Uh, and they said here, even the most experts people will disagree with. Uh, which is exactly what this video is, because I disagree on some of the things he says. So they've asked him, what are the three main things that you that are your guiding principles as a as a as a nutritionist, as a dietitian? He said the first thing, the second thing, and this is the third main point that is his overall sort of guiding approach towards um, diet. And then the final thing, and, and we published a paper on it at John Moore's with my colleague James Morton, this concept that we've now called fuel for the work required which is when it comes to carbohydrates, we try and dictate the carbohydrate needs on the amount of work that's required. So when I'm building a diet for an athlete, I start off with getting the protein right, which is around about one and a half grams per kilogram body mass spread evenly throughout the day. I have a massive then emphasis on, on vegetables and fruits and you know, trying to get loads of micronutrients in. And then when it comes to the carbohydrates, I'm anywhere between, let's say, two grams per kilogram body mass and 12 to 14 grams per kilogram body mass, yeah. dependent on what work is required. So, you know, my colleagues who are working in, in pro cycling, if they're trying to fuel a mountain stage, you know, I've seen Sam Impey this week putting tweets, so it's up at 16 grams per kilogram body mass. On a rest day, we might be down at two. So we really do embrace that fuel for the work required. Okay, so this is where I really I start to disagree. And I've done a whole video on the whole idea of this carb periodization fuel for the work required thing. So I'll link that below. But I really dislike the idea that you're only allowed to eat a certain amount of carbs if you've done the work. Because carbohydrates, there's only three macronutrients. Well, alcohol is possibly. Anyway, there's only three main macronutrients. You need to eat carbohydrates to live. If you're even taking it out of the sports arena, just the everyday, regular, healthy diet needs carbohydrates in it. And those are that's not something that you need to exercise to do. This idea that work is only this specific intensity on the bike where you're then eating carbohydrates for, I think is total bullshit. Just living your life, going to work, living your day is is work and requires food. So I don't know I don't like the idea that people might be listening to this podcast, the everyday cyclist, then going home and being like, "Oh, I didn't do like that hard of a ride today, so like I haven't like earned my carbs." That's, I, I really find that backwards. I do like the idea that if you're doing more work on the bike, that requires an above average level of carbohydrate needs and that needs to be fueled. So in that sense, I agree. Increase workload, increase your carbs. But I don't agree with the other side. Decrease your workload, decrease your carbs. Because you need to eat food to live. You need to eat normal meals. So just because you're not doing all this work on the bike doesn't mean you, you then need to cut your carb intake. 
You might eat less food overall throughout the day because you're not as hungry, but you're not, you don't need to count your grams of carbs and cut them out. I really think this idea is, is unhealthy and also just not helpful for, for the everyday cyclist. Mm, it's interesting because there is a paradigm that says don't sweat the tiny details, just be consistent in your diet and so on. Whereas, yes, so that was Ross Tucker there. I agree with what he's saying there, actually, is that carbohydrates aren't this volatile thing that needs to be cut back if you don't need them. You just eat your normal diet. If you're doing a big day on the bike and you have increased energy demands, increase your carb intake to fuel for that. And that's, that's as complex as it needs to be. The science hasn't been fully translated yet, but there is a literature around fueling some sessions with lower muscle glycogen yeah. to maximize adaptive response to exercise. Mm. So, you know, yes, all that has been based around mitochondrial enzymes, PGC1 alpha, things like that. Uh, there has been one paper that suggests that it does translate to actual better performance. But, you know, it's something that we have explored uh, and it's something that we certainly believe could be effective. So that carbohydrate manipulation as well allows us to do some sessions deliberately lower to see if we can enhance mitochondrial biogenesis. Hmm. He's, he's, he's five years behind. Like, no, I, I did an entire video on it. It's not necessary to manipulate your carbohydrates. It's very, there's so many potential, uh, I'll save the video, but no, essentially no. This, I wish they didn't even mention this in the podcast because it's completely irrelevant for pretty much everyone. Um, it's not, it probably doesn't boost your performance. Even if you do manage to get it to boost your performance, there's so many potential downsides. It's not worth even mentioning this. Like I just, it frustrates me that this concept is still in the discussion around sports nutrition. It really, I think it is really reductive and not helpful in the slightest. So the next thing you got onto later in the podcast was talking about why a, a prolonged low carbohydrate diet isn't good. And I think this was good information, so I'll let this play through. But this is why I think that whole fuel for the work required concept should just be thrown in the bin for most people because, because of this. And it's, it's totally muddies the water. So I will let this play through just because it's very good information. And we also know that a prolonged lower carbohydrate diet um, can decrease things like PDH, pyruvate di dehydrogenase act activity. So a key enzyme that we need to allow us to utilize carbs for these high intensity efforts. So what we might be doing is instead of spurring carbs, we're maybe impairing our ability to use them. So the rest some prolonged detrimental effects of that. So uh, I guess it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're a weekend warrior who just wants to go out on the bike, pedal for five or six hours, and lose a bit of body fat, well then, yeah, kind of do what you want, really, to an extent. Mm, I'll let this play out. If you want to win a Tour de France or win a World Cup at rugby, I'm still convinced that carbohydrates are king. Ah, he was close. <laughs> he was close, and I still, I still disagree. If you're a weekend warrior, going out for four or five hours, you're probably going to be smashing it. I know... I reckon weekend warriors going out on a Saturday, Sunday ride with a couple of mates are riding way harder even than a pro cyclist would do on a weekend. I've seen those rides. It's like four or five hours. You're sprinting up every hill. You might do four hours and get 250, 300 TSS. Like, they're proper smash fest. And to go out and do that and enjoy it and not get home completely fucked requires carbohydrates. You can't do that just eating whatever you want. So totally, again, missing the point that like, just, I totally disagree with that, that, oh, if you're not a pro cyclist, you can probably not really worry about your carbohydrate in intake because you don't need to. I totally, if anything, it's the opposite. Like a weekend warrior isn't going to be as efficient at oxidizing fat. They're going to be burning through way more carbs. You're operating at a higher percentage of your threshold. You're burning through way more carbs if you're a less fit weekend warrior. So just, you need to, even if you're not a pro, you still need to think about your fueling, especially if you go out and smash it on the weekend for four or five hours. Just completely disagree with what he said at the end of that section there. All right, last section for this video. He he brought up that the, that Game Changers documentary. I said the internet is a bane of my life. The other bane of my life is um, Netflix. <laughs> so just coming up to the, the Rugby World Cup final, the... Um, Netflix documentary of the Game Changers came out. Yeah. The, the vegan propaganda uh, yeah. documentary. Uh, I don't know if it's vegan propaganda. If, you, if he disagrees with stuff they said in it, 
from like a scientific perspective, then you should talk about it. I don't think just dismissing the entire movie as vegan propaganda necessarily throws out the things that they've some of the things they said. So I don't like this dismissive. Oh, it's vegan propaganda, so it's completely nothing they say is true. Um, he should know better than that as a scientist. And believe it or not, I was getting I'd come back from Japan by then, and I was getting messages people saying, "Should I go vegan this week?" And you're like, wow, we're building into a World Cup final and people asking about, should I go on a, a plant-based exclusive diet? So, Yeah, that's true. If, <laughs> if you're a professional athlete coming up to a target race, don't suddenly just switch your diet for no reason. Uh, good point. Um, I think I often get asked by players about extremes, but um, fortunately, I, I don't have too many that have given ridiculous challenges. So he used two words there at the end. He said ridiculous um, and extreme diet. I've been eating a plant-based diet for nearly six years and I don't find it particularly extreme or ridiculous. I eat pretty normal food. I just don't eat animal products. So he's totally just, you can tell, he just doesn't like it. He's totally just dismissed the entire topic um, and called it almost just taking the piss out of it. Vegan, plant-based, whatever. Um, flexitarian, you know, whatever you call it, is is at a stage now where you can't, it can't just be dismissed as this hippie, weird, ridiculous thing to be doing. Uh, it's a little bit more mainstream now. So again, I feel like this dietitian is sort of five years behind, um, to be honest. So he should um, get up to date with some of those things. So anyway, I'll end the video there. I hope you got something out of it. And I'll catch you in the next one.